Hello again, everybody. We're going to talk about a very, very pertinent topic here and one that gets hammered on the USMLE and any board examination, and that is sexually transmitted infections, also referred to as STIs, formerly referred to as STDs. Same thing, just a different word. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely feel free to subscribe to my channel and you'll get alerts as I put more and more videos up. I try to do about three to five a week. Um, so uh, definitely subscribe and stay tuned and you'll see when I put more videos up. All right, so STDs, uh, STIs is the better word, but STDs throughout the world, minus HIV, as you can see here, it is the global south, particularly Africa and the Indian subcontinent. Um, now, that's not to say these people are all running around with infections. Most of this has to do with poor sexual education, unfortunately. Um, and so it has been a priority in the Western world and in Europe and in, uh, in Australia and, and even parts of Eastern Asia to make sure that people have a proper sexual education. Unfortunately, religious um, influences uh, have, do get in the way of things. Um, but uh, as you can see, there is geographic disparity. Now, within the United States, there is also geographic disparity, and it kind of, again, follows along the lines of um, sort of religiosity. And I say this as a Catholic, you know, in a church where uh, sex ed is not exactly a popular thing. Um, but uh, you can see here that there is certainly geographic disparity, um, even though these numbers are from 2009. If you compare New Hampshire to Mississippi, you see about five times the rate of STIs. Now, these are going to be what we go over here quite a bit. Uh, you can see I put in blue here. These are more common things that you'll run into in the United States and therefore on your exam. There are a number of STIs that we're not going to talk about, uh, but uh, they are worth uh, looking at. Um, I do go into them in other talks. Now, how do we approach a patient who has a possible STI? Well, first of all, it's very important to obtain a sexual history, and that's easier said than done. All right, life is not the USMLE. It's not a multiple choice test. You're not going to be given a vignette. You're going to have a patient that comes in, and you need to be able to take this history. Now, a lot of patients are going to be really straightforward, and they're going to say, I think I've got an STD or... Um, you know, I've got this sort of thing going on in my vagina or in my penis, um, and they'll be straightforward with you. However, a lot of patients are going to be uncomfortable, and so it's very important that you set them at ease. Uh, so reassurance, uh, just uh, try to use very open body language. Um, another thing that uh, you can run into with difficulty is sexual orientation and stuff like that. And we'll get into, I'll give you some tips on how to get a, do a really good uh, sexual history. Now, it's worth noting that in the United States, we use chaperones. So if you are doing an intimate exam on a patient, so a female breast or genital exam, a male genital exam, any kind of rectal examination, Make sure and have another person present. If you are a male provider, you should certainly have a female, usually a nurse or a, a nursing assistant present while you do this. And this is mostly for medical legal purposes. Now, if the patient doesn't want someone in there, make sure and document it. Now, a proper sexual history is part of any comprehensive examination. Okay, you probably did this on your step two CS if you uh, are old enough, uh, but uh, this, is, this is so important. And studies have shown that patients don't reveal information because they think they're going to make their doctor uncomfortable or their nurse uncomfortable. Uh, and healthcare workers don't get the sexual history because they're afraid they're going to make the patient uncomfortable. So the onus is on you to get that sexual history. Unfortunately, there are a lot of wrong ways to take a sexual history, and I swear to God, over the last 11, 12 years, I have seen every wrong way. So there are three uh, really important pointers that I always tell my students. Number one, do not uh, ask the patient, are you promiscuous? Do you have a lot of sex? Don't do that. Ask the patient, about how many partners have you had in your life? Next, 
ask the patient, have your partners been men, women, or both? And you can even ask recently, have your partners been men, women, or both? But what we don't do is ask the patient's sexual orientation. We don't ask, are you gay or straight or bisexual? Uh, because a person could be engaging in, uh, it could be a man who has sex with men who is married to a woman. He may identify as straight. He may identify as bisexual. Um, so that's not as helpful. It's, it, 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 how you identify is not necessarily the sexual practices you're engaging in. And then we do ask the patient, what types of sexual activity are you engaged in? Oral, anal sex, vaginal sex. Some people have different, uh, some people will consider oral sex to be not sex and anal sex to be yes sex or vaginal sex to be yes sex. Um, so uh, it really is something that you just, you gotta be specific, okay? Very, very important. All right, let's start out with gonorrhea and chlamydia, certainly the most common, two of the most common venereal diseases. The causes are, are Neisseria gonorrhea, obviously for gonorrhea, and chlamydia trachomatis for non-gonococcal urethritis, which is generally chlamydia. The symptoms when you're talking about urethritis are going to be similar to a UTI, so dysuria, burning, urgency, and frequency, uh, but there may be discharge as well, or there may not be. Uh, fever, nausea, and vomiting may be present uh, as well. In females, they may have some uh, spotting, and they are also susceptible to cervicitis, uh, which would cause a cervical discharge. Now, incidentally, men are often asymptomatic, and so obviously this creates a problem for women. Uh, their male partners may be asymptomatic and pass it on to them. Likely, your physical exam is going to be unremarkable in a male. However, you should check for pain in the testes uh, for reasons we'll get into. Uh, in a female, it's useful to do a cervical exam because that can point towards the presence of cervicitis. For diagnosis, we use NAAT, nucleic acid amplification test. You're going to get a swabbing at least of the urethra um, and the cervix if it's a woman. Um, you should also get swabbings around the rectum and the oropharynx depending on their sexual practices. Most people who are sexually active do have oral sex, so oropharynx would be useful. This is going to be done in suspected gonorrhea or chlamydia, which are often but not always coexistent, uh, but uh, it is important that when you get the NAAT that you're submitting both for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Now the treatment has changed a little bit. Certainly has changed since I started my training back in 2000. And um, the, what we used to do was dual treatment for everyone. So if you got diagnosed with gonorrhea, we certainly did dual treatment. If you got diagnosed with chlamydia, we usually did dual treatment, but not anymore. So if the patient has gonorrhea, the treatment is ceftriaxone. If the patient is chlamydia, ideally it's doxycycline. However, if they're pregnant, then we go with azithromycin. We never use doxycycline in a pregnant patient because it is teratogenic. If the patient has HIV and AIDS, you're going to treat them the same way as anyone else. Remember the major complication, particularly of uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia, is pelvic inflammatory disease. You should know how that presents. And another thing that's worth remembering, especially if you're a step oneer, is to remember that Terminal complement deficiency is associated with an increased risk of Neisseria infections, and that's because we use those uh, complements seven, I think seven through nine, um, particularly to form that uh, membrane attack complex, which is really useful for fighting off Neisseria. Now, a lot of times you'll hear Neisseria meningitis, and that is true. Um, that's why we get the meningococcal vaccine in these patients. However, um, this can also happen in Neisseria gonorrhea, so they can, they're can they also at risk for gonococcal infections. Patient education is always going to be really important, so just some pointers. Remember, on CCS, you'll just say safe sex um, uh, counseling, I guess. Um, but safe sex is important. Remind them of what works, condoms and abstinence, and what doesn't work. Birth control will help you from getting pregnant, will not help you from getting uh, venereal disease. Certainly the PrEP, um, which is used for uh, preventing HIV AIDS, um, will work for that, but it does not work for venereal disease. Uh, pulling out 
ugh, I don't even think it's effective for preventing pregnancy, but it's certainly not effective for pre preventing venereal disease. Abstinence is the only 100% way of avoiding STIs. You need to stress this, but in practice, not quite as easy. Warn the patient of complications and then consider a pregnancy test. Generally, in all patients diagnosed with one STD, we test them for everything else, including pregnancy. Okay, this is what Neisseria gonorrhea would look like. You can see it inside uh, neutrophils. And again here, gram-negative diplococci. Epididymitis. So this is going to be in men, obviously. They're the only ones with an epididymis. And this is acute inflammation of the epididymis, which is a tubular structure just posterior to the testes. It's usually due to an STI, but it can also be due to enteric pathogens that can come with a UTI. Testicular torsion is an important differential. We'll get to that. So the causes here can be gonorrhea, Neisseria gonorrhea, chlamydia trachomatis, or another one called mycoplasma genitalium. We can test for all three of these. It can also be caused by enterics. The symptoms, um, this is slow onset unilateral scrotal pain. If you look at their scrotum, you're going to see around that area of pain on that side, there may be some surrounding erythema. It may also be warm. So make sure and feel with the dorsum of your hand, which is the easiest to feel temperature differences. Um, look for that. You can also see the prain sign. What that means is that if you elevate the affected side, the affected testicle, you may get a little bit of relief from the pain. Now, unlike torsion, Torsion presents with pain in an elevated and abnormally positioned testicle. The position of the testicle in epididymitis will be normal. The diagnosis here is usually clinical. This is a very unique presentation. However, you can get a dipstick urine test. You'll see positive leukocyte esterase. You can go on to get a urine, urine gram stain test for, uh, for chlamydia and gonorrhea, which are the two most common causes. You can also do an NAAT for mycoplasma genitalium. The treatment, ceftriaxone and doxycycline, both, both. Now, if the patient, and this is why history is so important, if they have a history of insertive anal sex, this is usually gay men, uh, if they have a history of insertive anal sex, the risk of an enteric pathogen is much higher. So uh, we're going to replace doxycycline with levofloxacin, which gets really, really, really good uh, activity against those enterics. All right, we'll go on to now to some STDs that cause ulcerations. A lot of these are uncommon in the United States. Chancroid, LGV, and granuloma inguinale. I've been practicing for quite a while now. I've never seen them. Chancroid. Uh, so this is multiple or solitary painful papule or papules that ulcerate and enlarge. They tend to have ragged edges. I will do another talk where I show pictures. I'm not going to show it here because... Uh, of YouTube issues, um, they eventually coalesce and they drain into the lymph nodes. This is very rare in the U.S. The cause is hemophilus decrae. Some people call this ducrae because ducrae makes you cry because it's painful. Chancroid. So physical exam, you may see uh, ulcers in various stages of healing. They're painful. Um, the lymphadenopathy is painful, so these patients aren't going to be happy campers. Diagnosis here, swab for gram stain. That's the best initial test. The most accurate, not best first, uh, is culture. Culture is always going to be the most accurate in an infectious disease. The treatment here is fairly straightforward. It's azithromycin or ceftriaxone. If they're HIV positive, you should go with ciprofloxacin. Lymphogranuloma venereum is a single transient painless lesion that ulcerates and then quickly heals. However, after time, it's going to give, give rise to this painful lymphadenopathy in the inguinal area on the side that's affected. It is also rare in the United States. It's caused by chlamydia trachomatis. Now, why does, the, why does this cause LGV instead of a chlamydial infection? There are multiple serovars. So serovars A through C of chlamydia trachomatis cause trachoma. That's where it gets its name from. Serovars D through K cause the chlamydial infection. So the urethritis or cervicitis. And that's the one we know and love. And then L1 through L3 cause lymphogranuloma venereum. 
This is important for step one, not so much for the other steps. Symptoms, we already talked about. Physical exam is stage dependent. You may or may not see the painless ulcer. You may or may not see the lymphadenopathy. Best initial step is to get a needle aspiration of the bubi, which is the affected lymph node. If that is not present, um, then you may need to wait or you can get NAAT. The treatment here is doxycycline or azithromycin. Obviously, azithromycin if you're dealing with a pregnant patient. Otherwise, doxycycline is pretty good. We're generally not worried about LGV in people under 8. Now, chancroid versus LGV, how do we tell the difference? Uh, so it's very similar in how the ulcer appears. However, LGV is going to have pain coming from the lymphadenopathy, whereas in chancroid, the pain can come from the lymphadenopathy and from the ulcer. Okay, so in LGV, the ulcer does not hurt, but the lymphadenopathy hurts. In chancroid, they both hurt. Genital herpes, very common in the U.S. This is painful vesicles and ulcers in the genital or anal rectal area. Usually, there's a prodrome, they itch, it burns, it doesn't feel really great, and then a lot of times the patient knows it, and then they get the eruption. The cause is the herpes simplex virus. Uh, we talked about the symptoms. There may be some accompanying flu-like symptoms, uh, and it can be seen anywhere sexual contact is made, so even in the oropharynx. Diagnosis here, PCR. Okay, It's supplanted the zinc smear. We don't do that anymore. Viral culture is less sensitive, but it's important to get because we look for viral sensitivity. The best treatment is acyclovir. However, some strains are going to be resistant to acyclovir. So if it is resistant to acyclovir, if that comes back on the lab or you give the patient acyclovir, they don't respond, then you go with phoscarnate. Now, the wrong answer is gancyclovir. Why? Because that's for CMV. Now, the patient can be put on acyclovir or the more convenient valacyclovir for chronic suppression. So if you give them acyclovir, it goes away and then it comes back and then it goes away and comes back. You can give them valacyclovir uh, on a regular basis that will prevent eruptions. Patient, of course, should inform partners with any STD. Pregnant women with genital lesions at the time of delivery are recommended to have a C-section. That's an important OBGYN question. Syphilis is a multisystemic, multiphasic infection. Uh, it's classically characterized by a uh, painless genital lesion, uh, but it can go on to progress to a systemic disease if it's not treated and it has a very long indolent phase. The cause is treponema pallidum, which is a spirochete. The symptoms depend on the stage. Primary syphilis is where we see the genital nodule. There may be some lymphadenopathy. Secondary syphilis uh, will be that uh, diffuse pigmented papules that come in the hands and feet. Um, they can also have flu-like symptoms. And then over a very long period of time, if they're not treated with penicillin, they will go on to develop tertiary syphilis, uh, where they, they can get that tabes dorsalis, and they get uh, the gummas and the argyl Roberts, robertson pupils, which you've probably never seen because we treat people in the U.S. Um, in other developing countries, um, treatment is a little harder to come by. So uh, the best initial test is going to depend on the stage you're suspecting. Primary syphilis, just uh, get a swab and do a dark field microscopy. It's the most best initial and the most accurate test. Secondary and tertiary syphilis, RPR or FTA. Uh, it's more sensitive in secondary syphilis. In tertiary syphilis, we're often getting a lumbar puncture. We can test the CSF. For, uh, with these tests. The treatment is benzathine penicillin. It, is, it was the treatment of choice 50 years ago. It's still the treatment of choice. We don't have uh, much resistance, so we still use this. The dose and route varies by stage. However, on the USMLE, you'll not be expected to know the dose. You will be expected to know the, the route. So if you're dealing with tertiary syphilis, um, Oh, I didn't put it here. Okay, so if you're dealing with tertiary syphilis, uh, you need to give it IV, IV penicillin. And you always give penicillin in tertiary syphilis. Even if the patient is allergic, you still have to give uh, penicillin. We will desensitize the patient. So if you're primary or secondary, you can use doxycycline if the patient is allergic. However, in tertiary syphilis, only penicillin. If they're allergic, we've got to go through the arduous process of desensitizing them. Granuloma inguinale, also very uncommon in the United States, fewer than 100 reported cases per year. The common uh, description of this is a beefy red lesion, and they get bigger. 
Uh, it is, despite its appearance, it looks really painful, but it's actually not really that painful. Uh, but they are very large. The quickest way to diagnose is the right GEMSA stain. Um, it's probably the best diagnostic step, but the most definitive step is a biopsy. We treat this with either doxycycline or cotrimoxazole, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Uh, in pregnant women, however, azithromycin is better. We don't want to use either of these drugs, doxycycline uh, because of bone problems and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole because it's a folate um, antagonist or inhibitor or whatever. Uh, it blocks uh, the production of folate and so it can cause neural tube defects. Genital warts is very, very common. It's caused by HPV. Uh, multiple pedunculating cauliflower-like growths. You've probably seen this before. Uh, they start out as little papules and they enlarge and they look like cauliflower. Now, unlike syphilis, the condylomalata of, uh, of, of syphilis, sorry, um, unlike warts, the condylomalata of syphilis are usually flat-topped, whereas in genital warts, it's that cauliflower-like appearance. The diagnosis here is clinical, and the treatment just depends on the severity and the patient preference. Medical treatment include imiquimod and podophyllin. However, some patients want these gone right away. You can do cryotherapy or other techniques. It really mostly just depends on the patient's preference. So this is just a sh cheat sheet of what I went over. Um, and you'll be expected on your exam to know the best diagnostic test and certainly the treatment. Uh, again, gonorrhea, chlamydia, epididymitis, herpes, syphilis, and warts are going to be the most commonly tested because they are the most common in the United States.